I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today is Caspar Rose, who's Chief Data Officer at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. So my first question for you is that, obviously, this year, um, we've seen the electric vehicle market continue to grow. I wanted to ask you if you could maybe start by giving a bit of context as to how in the battery manufacturing space has developed this past year. Uh, maybe what have been some of the key trends you've seen in 2022? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, as you say, like the, the main trend would be a, a big increase in the volume of production. So uh, about 40% increase in sort of terms of capacity of batteries that were produced this year versus last year, um, which I'd say is, is the major trend. So uh, lots of new battery plants, lots of new capacity now producing and delivering into largely the EV market, but sort of growing ESS spectrum as well. I think one of the kind of key trends uh, within that as well has been the kind of continued growth of LFP, lithium ion phosphate batteries within the Chinese market specifically um, and a, a growing market share there. So kind of a sort of changing, slightly changing mix of, mm -hmm. of cathode technologies, but, you know, overarchingly it's been, it's been big numbers, big capacity um, production. And um, uh, we've seen countries like the U.S. pushing for more domestic battery manufacturing, uh, taking steps, you know, to ensure this uh, supply chain is less dependent on Asia. What do you think remains a misunderstanding in terms of building out domestic battery manufacturing? Yeah, I mean, yeah, as you say, the U.S. has been very aggressive in terms of the incentives that have been put in place to build that domestic supply chain. Um, I think, you know, fundamentally, one of the challenges that potentially the you know that, that, that plays into all of this is you can build the battery plants, you can build the EV plants, you can build the cathode plants, but if you don't have the raw materials to feed them, you know they're just expensive um, weights on your balance sheet. So mm -hmm. um, you know the challenge is that some of this uh, legislation comes in in a, a relatively short time frame when we're thinking about like mining terms. Mm -hmm. So starting in 2024 and, you know, obviously sort of, let's say sort of penalties or, you know, not qualifying for the incentives um, you know, from that time frame onwards. And when we think about building out a domestic battery supply chain, uh, the challenge you have is, in particular is that even if as i say if you invest in that kind of midstream and downstream capacity you're looking at you know two three maybe worst case scenario four years to build out um a new battery plant a new cathode plant uh whatever it may be new anode plant but when you think about a mine typically the time frames are going to be a lot longer so absolute best case scenario i'd say for an expansion would be five years but in reality you're looking at seven plus years from discovery to production so um that create that creates a challenge now obviously with the legislation in particular you can rely on uh, FTA countries free trade agreement countries and that will help because there's some ongoing expansions across battery materials in those countries that do have the FTAs but I think um you know those those raw materials you know it's not just the US that are vying for those it's a global scramble for for battery materials and I think that you can't bank on the fact that you're going to have adequate supply um, so I think, you know, there needs to be some kind of more clear guidelines on how raw material capacity expansion can be accelerated domestically in North America as well. All right. Um, but are you expecting more cathode production in the Western world then, or will we continue to see China dominate the space for cathode I mean, production in particular? Yep. Yeah, yeah. For cathode production in particular, I mean, you know, if you look at the pipeline of capacity that's due to come online, whether it be in construction or in the planning phase, you know, over 90 percent of that capacity at the moment sits within China uh, of future plans. Now, obviously, that's just capacity plans. That's not that doesn't mean that all of that's going to make it to production. Um, and there's some really aggressive plans in China, particularly around LFP, which to, which skew the numbers slightly, but nonetheless, you know, there hasn't been adequate investment um, in Europe or North America or you know outside of China in that type of capacity. So we are starting to see that now. Um, uh, I know recently LG Chem announced a, a cafe plant in North America uh, just last week, I think. Or um, so, yeah, I think those those midstream plans, which have been very much overlooked, I think 
uh, in, in prior years. So, you know, if you particularly in the US and in Europe to a, a slightly lesser extent, but still in a, in a big way, plans are very much focused around battery production and, of course, EV production because you have large automakers in those regions. But that midstream hasn't hasn't really been well tended to. And I think um, with the added impetus of the Inflation Reduction Act in, in North America and obviously Europe um, seeing that and, and realizing the need more and more for kind of a local or let's say regional uh, lithium ion battery supply chain, we're starting to see those investments happen. But, you know, that's a building a new cathode plant is a two, three year time horizon in reality, best case scenario. So there's still going to be some some time where um, before we see those those plants come online. And and you did touch a bit on raw materials. Um, and we've seen prices for lithium in particular remain quite high um, mm -hmm. this past year. Uh, but how much does price concern battery manufacturers at this moment? Is price secondary to securing supply volume and quality of that supply? Um, I mean, it, it varies by mineral in kind of how significant that, that concern is. I mean, obviously, as you say, for lithium, Price is a huge concern, and I think we're kind of at a pain point in the industry where mm -hmm. prices are so high. You know, it's it's having such a significant impact on the cost of batteries, or I guess more importantly, being able to bring down the cost of batteries, like moving towards the lower and lower price points that have been targeted for a long time. Um, I would say probably security of supply for lithium slight is slightly ahead of price at the moment mm -hmm. just because mm -hmm. of what's happened particularly this year and you know arguably that um lithium has been a, a a drag on the industry in terms of how quickly it can ramp up production um i'd say for the other battery raw materials that hasn't transpired so much and there has been kind of a adequate supply to, to meet demand so i'd say you know it's less let's say security of supply currently is less of a concern in the market today for other battery raw materials. But, you know, if you, as you look out over different time horizons, obviously those concerns change, but um, yeah, I'd say, you know, for lithium, yeah, probably security of supply, getting that locked in now to make sure you have material and then looking at ways to kind of bring down the cost um, in the future moving forward. All right. And also you actually mentioned it, but I wanted to ask you about other battery metals. Uh, in particular, cobalt. So maybe some investors might be wondering why haven't cobalt prices uh, remained high as lithium has uh, this past year? What has been the dynamic in that market that, that hasn't allowed cobalt prices to remain at that high high level? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, that that's a, it's a really good demonstration of the difference between mark, a market that's uh, fundamentally in deficit, being lithium, and one that um, was going through a period of tightness in some some ways linked to logistics and being able to get material to where it needed to be which was then resolved and then we saw cobalt prices sort of correct so the cobalt market isn't in deficit at the moment and um, there's adequate supply for demand you know part of that is down to the fact that there's been a bigger uptake of lfp uh in china than was than as originally anticipated which has obviously has a direct impact on cobalt demand and importantly this year in particular what we've seen is sort of lackluster demand from com the consumer electronics industry, so smartphones and laptops. And that, and, and, and in some ways, that's a kind of legacy impact of COVID in the sense that during the pandemic, many people replaced uh, smartphones, tablets, laptops, because they were working from home or spending more time at home and wanted a, you know, a newer, quicker device. So what we've heard this year is, you know, across the value chain is that demand for consumer electronics has been diminished. And that has an outsized impact on cobalt because those batteries are very, very cobalt rich compared to those that go into EVs. So you've had a few kind of headwinds for the market. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we saw was um, in Q1, uh, a really big increase in demand across battery raw materials. It's cobalt, lithium, nickel. If you look at the price curves, you can see every price went up for various different reasons. But then as the supply chain adjusted and rebalanced itself, um, for cobalt and for nickel, and we saw like more normalized pricing, where lith uh, lithium prices have remained higher is because that market is in deficit and, and the market's been very tight and there hasn't been adequate supply to meet demand. And uh, as we move on to um, 2023 next year, maybe into the mid of, of, of the decade, 
Um, what are you seeing in terms of automakers' cathode choice? Will LFB and NCM maintain their market share in the short to medium term? Yeah, so um, there's a few things going on. So yeah, I think kind of on a global basis, we'll see um, LFP start to make its way into uh, more models, um, which hasn't been the case so far. I mean, there's very few LFP-based electric vehicles um, outside of China comparatively. And um, there's a couple, but you know, not, not really that many, but we'll start to see that change over time. We'll start to see more of that bleed into the kind of global market. Um, so that will be kind of one piece of the pie. The other piece is kind of what we're seeing across nickel-based chemistries. So certainly in like the premium end of the market where people are, are wanting the maximum range possible, driving range. We're seeing that shift towards higher nickel, so like eight series and nine series NCM chemistries. Um, but one thing we have seen sort of as, as an emerging trend is um, the kind of mid-range vehicles is rather than going to those very high nickel chemistries uh, where um, you need to be very careful around thermal management and that, that adds cost in terms of coatings, um, in terms of thermal management hardware and software. Um, what we're seeing is that some automakers are, are looking at or opting for uh, kind of more, more mid-range nickel-based chemistries, like six series, um, and using a higher voltage to get to a higher energy density without having to worry about the thermal management. So there's there's a lot a lot going on. You know, certainly the the cathode technology pathway is not set. We may see some more manganese-rich chemistries come into the market in that time frame as well. So things are changing, but I think kind of more broadly, yeah, LFP, um, uh, sort of more uh, use outside of China and mm -hmm. still very much a focus, you know, the, the largest piece of kind of market share will be down to nickel-based chemistries, but still some sort of changing uh, ratios of the raw materials in there, um, uh, which are still yet to be, you know, finalized, to be honest with you. All right. And just switching gears for a moment to the anode sector. Uh, I also wanted to talk to you about um, graphite, which we know doesn't receive much much attention. Um, why do you think we might be at a tipping point for this market? Just the volume, uh, the, the, you know, the rate at which the market has been growing, um, which is, as I said, particularly accelerated over the last couple of years. I think um, we've seen growth rates in 21 and 22 of around 40% year over year instead of kind of early 20% in the few years running up to that. So in terms of cell demand. So, and then when we think about raw materials, actually graphite's the largest component by weight, you know, compared to any other battery raw material that goes in that we look at like lithium or nickel or cobalt. So each you know gigawatt hour or megawatt hour of capacity that's deployed that it has a big impact on graphite and to some extent um whilst we have seen some investment in new capacity it's not been uh, it's a new graphite production capacity it's not been adequate and um the other key piece as well is we're seeing that battery you or battery industry is taking up a larger and larger larger market share of the end use of graphite you know away from industrial markets and be it becoming more battery dependent so all of these factors are playing on what what um what flake size is needed in the gra natural graphite market what kind of grades of synthetic graphite are required by the battery industry and we're seeing some potential tightness um lo looking into 2023 so it's certainly a market to um to keep watching all right. And um, my last question for you today was about uh, new technologies um, and new tech breakthroughs when it comes to um, to batteries. Um, what thoughts could you leave our audience when looking at, at this type of news of, of new batteries coming into the market? And is there any other battery metal that they should be paying attention to maybe in the next decade? Yeah, sure. Um... Yeah, I mean, one thing I would definitely say is that when you see news about a completely new battery type, like a uh, new chemistry, just, you know, treat it to some extent with some caution on the basis that it takes a long time to qualify any new chemistry and commercialize and take to market. So a lab scale, you know, it may sound very promising, but the realities of commercialization are very different. And so, you know, it, it's, it's a long shot slash long time frame if it does happen at all. Um, I think, you know, keep watching and when we're talking about like a sort of big change in chemistry uh, or not, not necessarily chemistry, like battery technology, um, keep watching solid 
solid state battery technology development. I think that's the potential sort of wide scale superseder to the lithium ion that we're using today. Um, and in terms of battery materials, obviously, if you do, if you did move towards uh, solid state, you would be thinking about lithium metal. As I mentioned kind of earlier, um, you know, we were hearing a, a bit more about kind of more manganese rich chemistries. So thinking about battery grade manganese chemicals. Um, you know, I think largely when we think about, let's say, to the end of the de decade, the battery raw materials that we're using today are likely to be the ones that we're using, you know, as I say, in that time frame towards the end of the decade. So keeping an eye on all those key markets, um, some, you know, technology changes within those chemistries are likely. But, um, yeah, I think the pathway is largely set for that kind of duration. All right, Casper, thank you so much for joining me today. No problem. Thank you very much.